When I was 12, I encountered a lot of my favorite works of art that would go on to define who I was as a person substantially for years to come. The biggest influence on my channel in a sense that's easy to identify to an outside viewer is Final Fantasy VI. I talk about that game a lot. However, there is one work that has influenced me in a much more indirect way. One that you would only really notice if you, too, bore the same curse of having knowledge of it that I do. Allow me to divulge to you the biggest influence on my writing style and aestheticism that exists. Homestuck. Most of my writing and its aspects can be traced back to Homestuck in some way. The smarmy narration that weaves between poetic and snarky is one, and the non-linear style of a lot of my storytelling is another. But in the most basic sense, the villainous Jack Noir is literally the namesake of my channel, words taken from the song Ballad of Jack Noir. While Jack Noir isn't the principal villain of Homestuck's text, though he is initially positioned to be in the early stages, he is absolutely the coolest character in an aesthetic sense. But much like everything in Homestuck, these aesthetics aren't simply aesthetics. There are complicated layers to all of the symbols in the story. Let's talk about the basics of Jack Noir as a character. Jack Noir is one of the Carapicians, a race of game construct NPCs in Homestuck that are inspired by chess. This starts a trend with Jack Noir. He is inspired by different aspects of tactile games that have been played for centuries, much like many other things in Homestuck are. The chess stuff isn't a super huge part of his character. He does commit regicide at one point, which makes him probably the best chess player of anyone in the comic, but its intersection with his playing card motifs and the pool table motifs of a group of characters known as the Felt is an interesting aspect of the game that is played in the comic as a whole, aside from Jack Noir. Spurb is the reality-altering video game that is the catalyst for the story, and that Jack Noir is an NPC in, and Spurb itself is fixated largely on these ideas of the game's that people have historically played. Ultimately, reality is all one large game, Spurb, and Homestuck at large, posits through this choice, and all the games that we've played through history are tied through this shared tradition. Jack Noir then inherently doesn't play by the rules of this game. He captures the queen, makes it to the other end of the board, and becomes the queen himself from just a lowly pawn from Scurrilous Straggler to Sovereign Slayer. The more important game motif of Jack Noir is that of the playing card, however. This recurs throughout all of his imagery. His name is literally French for Blackjack, as in the playing card game. That being the card game that represents Jack is fitting considering that game's extreme unpredictability. There are no guaranteed strategies, much like how Jack ascending to power can happen at any time regardless of the main player's actions. Whether or not you fold or stay, his victory is an occurrence that you have to plan for. In the comic, the kids did nothing that would have ever made sense to lead to Jack Noir's ascension, but he ascended regardless. Jack Noir's suit is the spade, which is often considered the highest ranking suit of cards when you have a dispute between otherwise identical hands. This tracks with his position as the leader of a group of three other agents, and of course his eventual rise to power. There's a reason he's called the Arch Agent and not just... well, the Agent. The role of Archagent also fulfills a similar role to the other thing Jack's name alludes to, that being it appears as if it's the second in command to the Monarchs of Durst, the villainous forces that make up Spurb's intended antagonists. In almost every playing card game, Jack is the third from the top in terms of the regal hierarchy. These connections, however, are merely the basics. To explain what comes next, I must explain a core aspect of Spurb's design philosophy. Spurb has video game guides like many adventure games have. Think of something like Navi from Ocarina of Time. Each individual player has their own. A bespoke element, however, is that the characteristics of said guide are determined by what the player puts into them. Those characteristics, upon entry into the game world if done before that entry, are then spread throughout the game NPCs and they take on some of those attributes. In the case of the game session played in the comic, the main character June unknowingly prototyped, which is the term for this process where the guide takes on certain attributes, a Harlequin doll into the Colonel Sprite guide. The effect of this is that Jack is forced to wear Harlequin clothes, which Jack despises and rejects, yet he ends up playing the role of a Joker in a playing card deck perfectly. In a lot of card games, Jokers simply aren't allowed. They can take the role of any other card if you need to, which makes them an undesirable variable to have in your game state. 
Jack Noir is that unregulated variable. He is the Joker in the deck of cards. And much like a Joker, he ends up taking a role that he wasn't intended to take. The Harlequin doll has another peculiarity. It has an eye cut out and one of its arms missing. This leaves the same effect on the prototype Jack as well. This ties into the Jack of Spades card itself. The missing arm and the missing eye are both parts of their body that just aren't visible on the card, and in casual parlance, the card is often referred to as a one-eyed Jack. This connection also ties back to Vriska, of all people. One of the main characters of the comic and one with fairly complicated reasons for doing the things she does, Vriska's actions lead her to be compared to Jack directly a few times throughout the comic. Prior to her regaining them through a game mechanic, she similarly lost the same things as Jack did in terms of her physiology, her left eye and her left arm. In a doomed timeline, they went up against each other in a duel. The parallel between the two is striking, but while Jack rebels against his fate by trying to make everything die, Vriska's renegade nature is out of a desire to become the hero who saves everyone. Despite their similarities, they couldn't be more different. The second prototype contained both a dead cat and a Cthulhu princess doll. This ties into Jack's connection with the Elder Gods of Homestuck. When I refer to the Elder Gods, however, I don't refer to the horror terrors. While they are parodies of the old ones present in a lot of horror stories at a cosmic scope, in Homestuck they are more of a looming neutral presence than anything directly threatening, most of the time. They even create the afterlife for the players of the game, a safety net for those who died where they might be able to get a second chance. Horror terrors are getting murdered by the true Elder Gods of Homestuck. Who I am referring to here are the principal villains Lord English and Doc Scratch, those who gain their power from the Green Sun and Predestination itself, those who control the narrative and the narrative truly centers around. They are beyond even Spurb's control, forces that have gained their power from the game, but massively surpassed it. While Jack is still largely confined to this game, his acquisition of the tentacles represents how he siphons power from Lord English later. After all, his fourth prototyping allows him to draw immortality and omnipresence from the Green Sun. They also tie into the apocalyptic Red Miles, an attack that Jack has access to his prototyping that assumedly every ring bearer gets to use. An ever-present set of tendrils that burrow themselves into all aspects of the game they find themselves in, totally destroying it. The third prototyping is possibly my favorite in a purely aesthetic sense. It was a dead crow with a sword pierced through it. This leads to Jack having a sword through his stomach that he can sheath and unsheath inside of his abdomen, and the wings of a corvid on his back. Though the dark black feathers make for an imposing presence, it's the less interesting aspect of this to me, even if a group of crows is called a murder. The sword in his stomach, however, makes for some interesting imagery. Throughout Homestuck, there are many swords plunged through many stomachs. Of course, Jack has this by coincidence in the diegesis, but it is often imagery associated with the nature of sacrifice. A friend stabs the sword through another friend's chest, sacrificing the only person she truly cared for. A male woman gives up everything she is in order to pursue Jack Noir. Our main hero, June, is killed in a random moment, her death the opposite of sacrifice. One of the game guides also has a sword through his stomach the entire way through the story as a consequence of prototyping, but the circumstances of his prototyping were much more tragic. He's a player from a doomed timeline, and the only way for him to save it was to go back in time to the Alpha timeline. However, as long as he existed as another human, there was no saving him. So he prototyped himself into the Alpha version of himself's game guide and gave up his own identity to help the new timeline succeed. He lost everything. It's interesting, then, that this imagery of sacrifice and loss is tied to Jack Noir. He's not a man who has anything to lose. He has no attachments he meaningfully cares about for the most part. He is the one who brings loss and sacrifice and ruin. He is the dark-winged angel of death. To talk on his fourth prototyping, however, refers back to the one attachment he does meaningfully care about. When he is prototyped with one of the player's dogs, he suddenly becomes very attached to that player in the same way that that dog once was. This is in stark contrast to everything else about Jack in this wolf form. That canine drew his power from the green sun and is what ends up allowing Jack to gain those powers as well from the prototyping. He is an imposing force, the terrifying and vicious beast that haunts the game session the main characters are in, and ultimately what makes it so they can't win the game in its original state. 
Jack Noir is the apex predator. Jack Noir is the scariest force they have to reckon with, even if he is just simply taking power from Lord English at this point in time. He is also, however, the best friend of one of the players, an uncomfortable and interesting juxtaposition. There's really nothing else left to say about Jack Noir, though, is there? I've covered all the variations upon him in the comic and discussed what they all mean. Clearly, then, there's no stone left on. There are two other Jack Noirs. After all, he is an NPC in every game state in Spurb. And we see three instances of him. Technically four, but the one in the Cherub session, or Lord English's session when he was a child, is so irrelevant to the main narrative that there isn't a ton to say about him. It's interesting that he wears grey instead of black though, the latter being typical of Jack Noir's starting outfit in a Spurb session. Perhaps this change in attire is simply to underscore that this Jack is less relevant, more standard? His fashion isn't as striking, his standards more dubious. He's hardly a factor, so it's hard to say. Interesting that even then, though, Lord English was forging alliances with Jack Noir, the child version of the time-traveling demon. The principal Jack Noir of the ones from other universes, however, is possibly the Jack Noir we know the most about since we spend the most time with him as protagonist. This is Spade Slick, the leader of the agents of Durs and the Troll Session, which he has titled The Midnight Crew. The Midnight Crew are a parody of film noir gangs, with each member styled after a different suit of a playing card deck. Of course, Jack is the Spade, because Spades are often the highest suit in the hierarchy as we established earlier. I feel it appropriate at this point in time to explain something else regarding Jack's relationship to the symbol of the Spade that is exclusive to Homestuck, seeing as we are now in the Troll Session. Homestuck has its own symbolic its own set of ideas that it presents using visuals and associations. Most stories have this to a lesser extent, but Homestuck is so expansive that it's essential to understanding the text on even a basic level. The spade to a Homestuck reader takes on more than just a playing card game marker. It's also a representation of one of the four quadrants of troll romance, the Kismesistude. This is a form of rivalry, a kind of hate-love. Jack Noir has this with the queen in, well, spades in all sessions. Each other agent represents a different form of troll romance as well, but Jax is the most fitting. He has a deep-seated hatred toward all existence, and two versions of him end up destroying entire universes. That's some unholy kismet. Another detail about Spade Slick is that of his name. The Slick moniker in particular is another example of Homestuck's internal semiotics at play, but to explain this requires a lot more words. Forgive me in advance. In Spurb, the goal of the game is to create a new universe. Every universe's body is actually a gigantic cosmic frog known as the Genesis Frog. Where Jack Noir hails from, the moon of Durus, there's a lot of animosity toward these frogs due to Durus opposing the deterministic cycle of Spurb creating universe after universe. One colloquial, derisive nickname for the frog is Bilius Slick. Spade Slick took on that last name solely for the fact that the Queen hated it. Another act of rebellion against how he's expected to act. Jack Noir in all his forms is programmed to be renegade. Spades, too, becomes tied up with Lord English in some capacity. This is ironic for the reason that Spades explicitly despises Lord English for destroying a casino of his, and his motivation throughout the story is to get revenge for the casino that was destroyed. Much like the earlier counterpart we discussed, he ends up getting some of his strength from Lord English. Lord English's Scepter. The Harlequin gains power once more through the act of pretending to be something that he is inherently not. One last thing to note about this version of Jack is that he has the same missing limbs as the other one we discussed previously. They're not entirely missing since he has cyborg replacements, but the divide is clear. The scars across time and space are shared by each of these Jacks, the ones who are successful in destroying their home universes. One pocketed the 8-ball and ended the game of pool, and the other was able to murder a giant frog with his bare tentacles. But there's one last version of Jack Noir to talk about. The final version of Jack Noir we are introduced to is the second human session Jack Noir, one in the alternate human universe after the first version of Jack Noir made the original game state totally unwinnable. This version, however, does not have those same scars of time. Instead, the scars on his body take on a different shape. Because he is merely a vessel for Lord English, that character's peg leg and gold tooth are the points of fracture, as well as the ever-changing billiard ball eyes. Granted, this also ties into the jacks of a deck of cards. There are four, but only two have one eye. 
though many call this particular instance of Jack Noir Jack English, which is a mediocre name, the name that I see most used for him that I particularly enjoy is Union Jack. This is to signify that he is the unification of Jack Noir and Lord English, and also in reference to the flag of the United Kingdom being known as the Union Jack. Lord English's connection to imperialist monarchy is something that we can discuss another day, but it's interesting when put in the context of Jack Noir as someone who so thoroughly rejects any kind of feudalist control over his own life. Ultimately, no amount of rebellion can sway the fierce, distorted, evil, predestined nature of Homestuck's universe. No amount of destruction or anger at everything that exists can stop what is already here. All versions of Jack rebel against the hand of fate. They all rebel against the man in the Cairo overcoat, playing cards, trying to usurp billiards. But in the end, the god of double death claims them all, the nature of Homestuck's own metafiction consuming itself personified. Jack Noir is the cool, traditional antagonist that was fun to see in the early pages of the story, but Lord English has always been, and always will be. There is no getting around that. This has been Archagent Everlasting, who insists she's realer than all those other Archagents, signing off. Thank you for watching.